In this video, I'd like to discuss some of the various leadership styles that we tend to see in small groups and, and how those leadership styles impact communication and, and how communication can be used to both engage as a leader and, and to emerge as a leader. So uh, let's begin with talking about leadership styles. So first, uh, one of the most historic views of, of leadership styles in small groups is what's called traits perspective. And this is the perspective that says that leaders are born and not made, that leaders are just kind of imbued with these inherent characteristics at birth. Um, and so some of the associated traits that we, that we see that these people are born with, so to speak, are things like physical attractiveness. Uh, this traits perspective says that people are drawn toward leaders who are good looking. And if you have, uh, if you have physical attractiveness, that that will work in your favor in emerging and, and engaging as a leader. Uh, we also see, you know, things like char charisma and extroversion uh, and traits perspective that says that these people are born with this, you know, innate charisma and this ability to draw people into them. And they just have this ability to connect with people and that they're extroverted by nature and uh, want to be around people, want to lead people, that they just have these things that are born into them that way. They're also born with intelligence, of course. Uh, you know, maybe not Einstein level intelligence, but a certain level of intelligence that makes them stand out. According to traits perspective, that's an important part of leadership. And so it's one of the associated traits. A decisiveness, the ability to, to quickly decide and, and make decisions and, and, and set people into motion, set events into motion, uh, is an important part of uh, traits perspective that's an associated trait there. And then character. Uh, of course, high character, being of high character. Just kidding. Uh, no, not about character, but about that uh, little graphic. You know, if you if you're a fan of The West Wing, you remember that show at all. You know that you know Jeb Bartlett was a man of character, a person of character, and and that was just born into him. It seems like in that show that he was always always had this character and high character. So we put all these things together, and it says traits percept traits perspective says that true leaders are born with these things as qualities that they already possess, not things that they really need to work for. I mean, maybe they can refine them or whatever, but, but they're born with these qualities and these character, these characteristics. Uh, what we find in studying this over time now is that traits perspective is really more descriptive of how leaders emerge than, than how they behave as leaders themselves. So, um, that these things, these associated traits, uh, that if people are born with them, then they may be more likely to emerge as a leader, or, you know, maybe, uh, we see them emerge more as leaders than people with other traits. You know, uh, people who are extroverted maybe emerge as leaders more than people who are introverted because they talk more, quite frankly. So, uh, so they may stand out more to the, to the different group members. But, uh, so it just really, uh, you know, describes more of how leaders tend to emerge and come out of a group rather than having to do with what happens once they become leaders. We find that these characteristics, uh, while they, they can be uh, effective in des describing whether or not somebody may emerge as a leader, they do less to tell us about whether they um, can actually function as an effective leader. And, uh, and so these characteristics may not all be, and, and that these characteristics uh, maybe things that people can learn and, and may not all be about who's born with them or whatever. So anyway, so traits perspective has come to be more um, associated with leadership emergence than leadership enactment. So, but it is a, a valid perspective on leadership styles and we want to consider that. So another leadership style we see is what's called the styles perspective. And sometimes this is really known as, uh, you know, well, the styles perspective. So with three leadership styles. Uh, that, that are inherent that says within styles perspective the styles perspective says there are three different leadership styles one is autocratic leadership where one person is really in charge and, and kind of the puppet master so to speak and they're they're moving the pieces around and telling people what to do and very very strict control over who's doing what and how they're doing it um, so we have autocratic leadership and then we also have democratic leadership which is somebody who's more inclusive uh, and and of group members and and not not that you know dictator style, but somebody who's considering their viewpoints and, and maybe you know taking votes and and you know, you know so we have this more democratic leadership style in styles perspective. And there is a third, which is what's called the laissez-faire uh, leadership style, and not so much preferred and not recommended. It's just kind of you know you sit back and see what happens. You let things just kind of unfold as they can, and it's just very much a hands-off type leader uh, and, and not really involved in much of anything. So. But really, we find that the autocratic and democratic, in terms of styles perspective, if we're defining group leadership, the autocratic and democratic are more effective in, in, in leadership enactment there. Really, which style is more effective depends on, and this is what styles perspective says. It says that, uh, that 
the most effective type of leadership is going to depend on the style of that group and what they prefer and the group agreement, whether the group agrees to be ruled by a dictator or whether they demand democracy or, or you know, things like that, or whether, they, you know, so what is it that the group prefers? And then, you know, the, we can apply the most appropriate style of leadership. Um, gender perceptions are a factor. Here we, you know, traditionally... Uh, if we find a, a female, someone with a, a feminine gender perspective, perception um, trying to enact an autocratic leadership style would find resistance because, you know, just traditionally we don't accept that from somebody with a, a, a femininely gendered perception. And uh, so that can be a, 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 a hindrance in some ways for somebody with that gender perception to try and enact that kind of style. So, I mean, you know, so those perceptions can be a factor in trying to apply these different styles. And truly, the most effective leadership style really requires both styles at different times. Uh, it depends on what the group needs are at that moment, not just group needs overall, but really what the group needs are at that moment. If the group is, you know, kind of uh, working and really chugging along, then maybe a democratic style is good. If you have good involvement, you have good minds, you have good, you know, engagement from the group members, then the democratic style uh, could could very much be uh, what is needed there. But but if you have a group who really kind of needs a kick in the rear and isn't doing much and really needs a lot of specific direct um, direction, you know, delegation and direction, then then you may need to shift in that autocratic style. And that may change over the life of the group. Uh, the group may not be the same at all times. They may go through peaks and valleys. And things. So you may need to adjust your leadership style. So the style's perspective is, is really dependent on, on the group needs at that moment. And so we can look at it in that perspective as well. Another perspective on leadership style is the situational perspective, which really says uh, just kind of it's it depends, and that's what's called sometimes the it depends approach. What that means is that you know every situation is a little different, as we were just kind of alluding to with the, the styles approach. But every situation is a little different, so you need to take it as it comes and see what happens. So this this situational perspective was put forth by Hersey and Blanchard in 2001, uh, formally and, and introduced by them, and and they they introduced these what we call four styles. They said there are four styles of leadership: um, the talent style, a selling style, a participating style, and the delegating style. And each of them ha exists on this kind of plane of, between task and relationship and have uh, different areas. So, for example, the telling style involves high task and low relationship perspective. So when you're telling somebody, again, we're back to that kind of autocratic, you're telling them what to do. It's very task oriented, uh, not very focused on that person and building that relationship or their relationship to the group, but you're just giving them orders and expecting them to be followed. So it's very much telling them what to do. Uh, which shows a high degree of concern for task and a low degree of concern for relationship. Selling style is where those two are uh, both at a high level. You know, selling style, we're, we're, we're um, trying to get uh, buy-in from our people, so we're selling them on this idea, selling them on our leadership, but we're also giving very specific directives and 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 putting things in motion. So, um, so we have the selling style, which is both a high degree of concern for task and relationship. Participating style, as you can tell, you can see a low low relationship to task, a high high perspective on relationship there, um, where you're really more focused on what do the group members want and what do they need personally, rather than what's going to help us achieve our goals in the end. Um, and then the delegating style shows a low degree of concern for both task and relationship. You're just kind of tossing off tasks without really concern for, for either one of those areas. So, uh, and, and it really kind of depends on uh, what that group needs and what they're ready for. So um, we have this, uh, you know, this, you have to match your style to the readiness in this perspective, this particular perspective. So the situational perspective comes with a, kind of a graph and a chart to, to demonstrate that like this. So so you can see on one axis we have the relationship behavior and the other we have the task behavior. Uh, the relationship behavior is very supportive, task behavior is very directive, and you can see where each of those things fall in there. Um, so the telling, again, has a high task and low relationship. It's in the S1 box, so um, so you can see where that falls. And in any, any again, moment, the group could need any one of these. You know, you really have to read what the group needs and what's going to be most effective in that, that particular situation for situational perspective, which, which does make it complicated, but um, also gives it that flexibility for the leader and, and requires a great deal of flexibility from the leader in order to match that style to the to the readiness there. It is influenced by outside forces. There are things you can't control. There's something, you know, were you assigned to this group or, or did they gather to you? Out of loyalty or, or desire to see that through, um, or you know, if you're dealing in a, in a group in a, in a workforce, you know, what's the economic situation? What's the you know, is there high demand or low demand? High supply, low supply. Those types of factors will influence the different types of uh, 
uh, readiness for the group and things. So it is influenced by outside forces. And you need to take that into account as well. We can also look at the distributive perspective, which is where we really have shared leadership. So there's no one particular leader at all times for the group. That's really just shared leadership. And so uh, in that situation, you have groups that have both, of course, tasks and social needs, as all as all groups do have those tasks and social task requirements and social needs. And so the group members really just kind of divide it up and they'll step up as something needs to be done and they'll fulfill that role as needed. So you have different people from the group stepping in as a leader for different at different times or in different ways to meet those tasks and social uh, needs. Uh, this does take advantage of the respective strengths of the group members, which is good. I mean, you can you have these people gathered together, you might as well use their strengths to your advantage. Um, but it can lead to role confusion. When you don't have one identified leader, then sometimes there's a confusion about, should I step up here, or is this person going to, or will I be stepping on toes if I try and uh, move into this area? And, and so there can be some role confusion, which is a challenge with distributive perspective, but works well for some groups and in some situations. You have ethical leadership is another leadership style uh, that we could consider. Uh, and this really relates to how the leaders treat their followers and, and what their perspective is on what their relationship is and what their role is overall in relation to those group followers and, and the other group members. Uh, ethical leaders are, by definition, servant leaders. Uh, so they're, they're seeking to um, serve their followers and, and really consider the need of their followers almost above uh, other things, but, but also balancing that with task, you know, task responsibilities as well, but, but they give almost concern for their followers. So uh, I want to put this in perspective just briefly by showing you, this is, this is what we would call, you know, the, the, the pyramid of management and management pyramid, typical pan, management pyramid called the hierarchy of ego because it has the CEO at the top and the executives at the top and, and then down below and then very the very bottom are the employees and the customers, you know, the, but everything flows down, right? Everything in the pinnacle of that is the CEO. So it all depends on what that CEO wants and what that person, what the person in charge wants and what their desires are, what their needs are. But in ethical leadership and servant leadership, we see that uh, flipped upside down. We have the inverted pyramid where the, the leader, the ultimate leader, the CEO, or whoever puts themselves at the bottom and says, OK, it's my job to support things moving upward through this pyramid. It's our job to serve these customers at the top and to serve these employees. So what do I need to do to support my executive team? And what does my executive team need to do to support our, our employees who then ultimately serve our customers, so to speak? So we have this this ethical servant leadership uh, that that flows from the bottom upward and have that inverted pyramid then. So ethical leaders are guided by these elements of, of the communication ethics, really. Uh, this is this is their, their playbook, really, their, their guidelines. Um, they, they respect honesty. They need honesty. They need to show respect. They have fairness. Uh, they allow for choice within the group. And they... Uh, and they focus on responsibility, both for themselves and for their group members, accepting responsibility for those things that they're responsible for. So they're really guided by these elements uh, in ethical leadership. You have a new kind of uh, perspective on leadership, which is called culture and leadership. And this really uh, evolved because nearly all leadership theories are American in character. They're really uh, focused on, they came from, you know, American studies, and, and so they're focused on individualized an individualistic culture and different things, and they don't really take into effect or take into account uh, lots of different cultural aspects. You know, most of our leadership theories are, are again, from the American perspective, and so they, they involve a lot of very American ideals and, and expectations and things. So the cultural uh, aspect of leadership uh, goes on to show that there are cultural differences in leadership effectiveness, depending on the culture that you're in. So we do recognize that there are there are cultural differences in what makes an effective leader, and we need to take those into account. So uh, studies also show some common leadership uh, traits, though, that are, that are effective, including these types of things, foresight and planning, positivity, encouragement, dynamism, motivation. Those are all things that are, that are common for all these different uh, cultural leadership aspects as well. Truthfully, this is still largely an unknown uh, area. We haven't had a lot of study when this is an emerging area, so we're going to have to continue to work on that and study it and understand it. Also, finally, the communication competence perspective. Really, this uh, indicates that effective leadership requires communication competence, which is something we've talked about, you know, in other videos. Communication competence is required for effective leadership. It really weaves through all these different perspectives, and communicating respect then is crucial and also too rare, though, in many situations. So if you have questions about leadership styles or any other aspect of small group communication, please feel free to email me. I'm always happy to, to discuss and engage via email and, and continue these conversations there. Uh, in the meantime, happy communicating.